you really can't make sense of all the stuff that's happening and what's happened in the 20th century with the two world wars and the cold war without understanding this game plan without understanding this hegelian dialectical conflict and synthesis which really undergirds the whole process of the way that the milner fabian elites uh, Lord Rothschild, Lord uh, Salisbury, you know, Lord Cecil, um, all of these different characters, Lord Curtis, who were involved in uh, Ruskin, Toynbee, H.G. Wells, all of these Royal Society elites who had this idea to use socialism uh, as a better means than Marxism. So even though the elite were in many ways behind funding Marxism from its inception, uh, even Engels himself was a, was a wealthy stock owner who kind of helped uh, Marx just kind of mooch and lay around and be lazy and write a bunch of nonsense. It actually ended up being a very interesting uh, techno uh, technology for destroying societies. And when the original Marxist plan for the revolution didn't really work, so they had a few phases of early revolutions, as you may or may not know. We know the French Revolution was basically a Marxist kind of revolution uh, with the Jacobins. And then you get Marx coming on the scene, as we said, in the mid 1800s. And then you get uh, some revolutions in the 1800s. But the real flowering of that revolution was, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution, right? That was the next phase of this really uh, intense, hardcore terror, terror using, red terror revolution. And the reason for that is that many of these Marxists, I think, not only were they just completely demonically possessed, but the Paris Commune, for example, engaged in. Red Terror. The uh, th that's where uh, Leon and uh, Leon Trotz, uh, uh, excuse me, Lenin and Trotsky uh, got this idea for Red Terror from the Paris Commune, and then engaged in all kinds of means and methodologies which would in, in, intended to rip apart the previous society completely, demolish it, so that you could have corporate socialism set up. And I call it corporate socialism because, as we've seen from Professor Anthony Sutton's works. Bolshevik Revolution was completely funded by the elites in the West. Three, the coming socialist dictatorship. Yes, that's right. And how a lot of what we're seeing might fit into the overall plans of the technocratic elite to move us into their uh, technocratic global governance, which <clears throat> I think is best titled corporate socialism. Uh, or we could call it scientific socialism, scientific governance. But corporate socialism is good because it, it really merges monopoly capitalism with not so much classical Marxism, which didn't achieve what they wanted to achieve with it, but rather socialism, Fabian socialism, that slow approach model, which has been very successful that the elite have used. That's the real uh, strategy. And so we want to look through some of the plans that they've had, how effective they've been. And if we understand that, <clears throat> we might be able to stop some of their future plans. And I don't know if we're going to stop World War III or if there will be World War III. But if there is, we know that it's for the purpose of a dialectical outcome of a order of the a new order of the ages that emerges out of these dialectical conflicts. And one thing that might emerge that I think not many people have talked about is if there is a Middle Eastern war and if there is a war that uh, breaks out as a result of um, not just Ukraine and Israel, or Ukraine and Russia, but um, Israel versus Palestine, the Arab world, the Muslim world, then it might be then ca uh, cast as look at nationalism. You see, because Jews are an ancient biblical notion of a nation state, nationalism is part of the problem, you see. Now, that's my own speculation that they might demonize it. But one of the reasons that Klaus and company have consistently said there's going to be an angrier world, an angrier world because of the conflicts and because of the, the bioweapons and because of the wars and because of the economic collapses that are coming, the food shortages, all this stuff that we saw a taste of in the last three years. What, what ended up being kind of the, the, the scapegoat? And what was the scapegoat that was mentioned in the Rockefeller uh, document, the lockstep document? Well, one of the scapegoats was the inadequacies and the uh, lack of capabilities of national governments to solve their own problems, which solution is then offered as the design solution of an international body, which is able to then adjudicate and divvy up uh, and solve the problems, solve the economic issues. So there's always this assumption that greater uh, centralization will be able to somehow solve the uh, localized problems. Of course, 
just because you centralize all the power doesn't necessarily mean the problems are going to be solved. In fact, you're just giving over more and more power to these centralized bodies. So let's look at the older, older plan that the technocratic global con men planned out about 170-ish years ago. So we'll go back to the first plan that we had that we know about. There was an older plan with Adam Weishaupt and his uh, his plan for Illuminism, which was an earlier proto form of communism. That's not conspiracy theory. That's mainline history from Firing the Minds of Men by James Billington. But the next phase of that was a rewritten plan that Karl Marx wrote when he was uh, in this little secret society called the League of the Just. And they said, hey, Karl, buddy, you got uh, a giant uh, atheistic beard there. We want you to write for us uh, a manifesto. And so Carl wrote a famous manifesto with planks. And I want to go through some of these planks and then talk about where it failed, but where it's succeeding, and then how that plan was reconstituted and then put into a different strategy uh, some years later. So the first plank was the abolition of property and land of all rents of land to public purpose. So basically the abolition of private property, right? And the abolition of private property is important because in their view, really the only way to manage society is if you have this quasi central, basically this a technocratic control system that's uh, totally centralized from the top down. And the, they begin with this in various countries, but then eventually it's intended to be international, right? So the idea is that everything that's holding back mankind is the barriers like family and nation. Those are things that hold us back from progress. Of course, we don't know what we're progressing to, except that Marx says, well, there'll be a withering away of the state in a future golden age. Uh, and machines will do all the work, and we'll all basically be free. We'll be libertarian. So people don't know this, but Marx's final stage was actually libertarianism. It was the idea that the uh, governments of the world would all wither away, and everybody would have total freedom. He says, you can go out and paint a picture, you can go and fish, you can do whatever you want when we get the final revolution. So successful in the abolition of all property, but they were successful in getting certain nations, and especially throughout the West, to begin to pass laws which would uh, severely limit um, public, or, or excuse me, private ownership. Laws like eminent domain, these kinds of things are, are socialist ideas. And in the countries where they tried these, these communes, of course, it failed, but they were able to begin to do this. But notice that the failure was the attempt to pass this through in terms of local communal organizers, right? The local communist boss or whatever, trying to uh, run these communal farms or whatever. And they, they didn't realize at that stage that maybe there would be better ways to manage these, these uh, communes and these you know, quasi-socialist uh, uh, ways of living that would later be solved via technocracy and smart cities. And I'm not, I'm not joking. So what the Marxist socialists were talking about in the 1850s, this kind of failed, uh, but now we're actually going into where they wanted to go. Number two, a heavy progressive graduated income tax. Of course, the IRS and all of this is the total manifestation of this. So they were very successful in getting this through, as well as the Federal Reserve Bank. People don't realize that the Federal Reserve Bank is actually something that's akin to uh, a more of a Marxist idea of how you would run the society. And that's why the next plank, or excuse me, the, the, the two planks later is the centralization of all banking or credit into the hands of the state. And by means of a national state capital and exclusive monopoly via this state bank. Now we have that essentially with the privately run Federal Reserve and somebody might say, well, that's not communist if it's run by a private entity, if it's run by a bunch of private individuals. Oh, but you see, Marxism was always about private individuals running these things with this cloak of humanitarianism. That's why Marxism was always funded by and run by the wealthiest people out there. Um, but the third plank was the abolition of all rights of inheritance. Now, we haven't gotten that yet. They haven't gotten that yet. I said we. People said, oh, clip it. He's one of the Marxists. They haven't gotten that yet, but we're going into that because we do have pretty heavy taxes on inheritance in the West. 
anybody that fled uh, countries or tried to flee uh, Marxist communist countries would immediately have their uh, property confiscated and thus anybody who rebelled against the system would be deplatformed. I wonder, have we seen any of that? Yes, we're beginning to see that. So notice that the, t the, the Fortune 100, Fortune 500 technocrat system, which a lot of people mistake for being purely a capitalist system, is corporate communism, corporate socialism. It's both of these things, you see, because the corporations themselves, they run on the stock market. They have, you know, they're publicly traded companies. They run on the dollar, but they're also private companies with key uh, government interface. And so they're given a lot of, a lot of these startups were given CIA front company in QTEL money, right? Like I think uh, Google, uh, Facebook, right? So it's a private public private partnership that is more uh, accurately kind of a corporate socialism than it is something like communism. So we've seen uh, a few of these planks already in place. The centralized Federal Reserve fiat system, uh, a debt-based system, that is actually a plank of the Communist Party, which is in place. And it's not just in the US. The intended IMF World Bank system is itself a Fabian socialist system. So the Bank for National Settlements is also the central bank of central banks. It's sort of the Federal Reserve Bank for the world. And you could say it's basically the same model. So that they did get through. Uh, the centralization of all communication and transport to be run by the state. Um, I would say that we're pretty far down that plank. It's not totally there, but uh, the corporate state or the corporate socialist state that we live under, it's almost there, at least when it comes to shutting down anybody who dissents. The, the, the censorship that we've seen in the last few years, this is the sixth plank of the Communist Party. Um, it's kind of there. But remember, or they're at least trying to put it in more and more, remember that this is the failed plan. So this is the original 1848 planks of the Communist Party that Marx wrote uh, for the League of the Just. And a lot of this didn't succeed. And so the socialist Marxists went back to the drawing board and said, let's, let's re-strategize and figure out a different plan. But a lot of this they did get through not so much at the time, because when they tried to force this stuff in, in the, the Marxist revolution, the Red Terror and all that, a lot of this just didn't work because it was so absurd and idealistic. And uh, the expectations were that the working class, the, the, the proletariat was going to cause all of this and bring about this revolution when nobody in the proletariat cares about all of Marx's theory of values. They're not going to read his boring ass Das Kapital. They want, uh, you know, cigarette breaks. They want lunch breaks. They don't care about this stuff. And so they had to, again, had to go back to the drawing board. A uh, number seven was that the state would take over all of the factories. Now, we don't have overt taking over of all of the corporate world, but you have that public-private partnership, which is essentially the same thing. Again, whether it's a single corporation running everything like a, a company town, or whether it's a gigantic centralized government, just think of the communist government or a Soviet style government, just think of it as the only corporation. And it's no different than all the other corporations you say. So corporate socialism. The next plank was equality of labor, or excuse me, equality of liability of all to labor. So everybody has a right to work. Everybody has the ability to, uh, you know, I guess, equality of outcome as well as a logical conclusion of this, which all of which is absurd because even Marx admitted that some people are more equipped for certain jobs and can get more work done, yet we have the quality of outcome uh, for, I mean, it's just it just makes no sense, right? Um, and even though we don't exactly have that yet, uh, we're beginning to see through a lot of the CRT, a lot of the woke stuff, a lot of the uh, lowering of standards for graduation, for education at all levels, uh, calling education racist, racism, calling math racist, all the stuff that they're pushing, it has the effect of doing what that plank was intended to do. Uh, the ninth plank was the combination of all agriculture and manufacturing and the abolition uh, uh, between distribution of the population in the country and in the cities. So you can't have country people being kind of self-sufficient and on their own and all of these uh, city soy bug men uh, that are deracinated and have to worship the state. You got to have everybody packed into cities and equally distribute this or have an equal distribution of the city people into the country. 
And this again, it has the effect of destroying people's livelihood and structure of life in the country to make it more metropolitan and to get them to adopt and to likewise to get people in the city who might be say in New York attached to Wall Street, right? To get them uh, attached to more agrarian communal ideas. And you know, if you if you remember when Alex went to New York a year or two ago, whenever that was, and there was the UN billboards uh, outside describing the type of life that you would have in the smart city, it would be this communal. I mean, again, it's very much like the older experiments in communal living that the Marxist socialists tried to do. Number 10 plank was the free education for all via public schools. But of course, the public schools are the indoctrination system. So they're not actually interested in giving all the workers education and giving them the ability to read, write, and do arithmetic. No, that it, the education system is intended eventually to become, this is a generation after Marx, a socializing institution. And this is what uh, Horace Mann, John Dewey, all these different uh, figures that dreamt up the American public education system, they said it would be the socializing tool to bring about the socialist world order. They explicitly said that um, a lot of the, the, the woman involved in the invention of kin kindergarten, her name is, a P, is Peabody. She said that kindergarten and socialist education would bring a new Pentecost to the world, literally. She saw it in a religious sense. This is the Alex Jones Show, don't go anywhere. Uh, we will be back in just a second as we cover the 10 planks of the Communist Party, and then how they had to reorganize it to bring about the uh, technocratic order. Welcome back to the fourth hour of the Alex Jones. So we're talking about the history of the attempt to bring in a scientific socialist government or a scientific dictatorship, corporate socialism. And the reason that we have to understand that is that you really can't make sense of all the stuff that's happening and what's happened in the 20th century with the two world wars and the Cold War without understanding this game plan, without understanding this Hegelian dialectical conflict and synthesis, which really undergirds the whole process of the way that the Milner Fabian elites, uh, Lord Rothschild, Lord uh, Salisbury, you know, Lord Cecil, um, all of these different characters, Lord Curtis, who were involved in uh, Ruskin, Toynbee, H.G. Wells, all of these Royal Society elites who had this idea to use socialism uh, as a better means than Marxism. So even though the elite were in many ways behind funding Marxism from its inception, uh, even Engels himself was a, was a wealthy stock owner who kind of helped uh, Marx just kind of mooch and lay around and be lazy and write a bunch of nonsense. It actually ended up being a very interesting uh, techn uh, technology for destroying societies. And when the original Marxist plan for the revolution didn't really work, so they had a few phases of early revolutions, as you may or may not know. We know the French Revolution was basically a Marxist kind of revolution uh, with the Jacobins. And then you get Marx coming on the scene, as we said, in the mid 1800s. And then you get uh, some revolutions in the 1800s. But the real flowering of that revolution was, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution, right? That was the next phase of this really uh, intense, hardcore terror, terror using, red terror revolution. And the reason for that is that many of these Marxists, I think, not only were they just completely demonically possessed, but the Paris Commune, for example, engaged in red terror. The uh, that's where uh, Leon, uh, Leon Trotsky, uh, uh, excuse me, Lenin and Trotsky. Uh, got this idea for red terror from the Paris Commune, and then engaged in all kinds of means and methodologies which would in, in, intended to rip apart the previous society, completely demolish it, so that you could have corporate socialism set up. And I call it corporate socialism because as we've seen from Professor Anthony Sutton's works, Bolshevik Revolution was completely funded by the elites in the West. And so this then led to people in England saying, well, is this going to work? We had the Fabian Society essentially supporting the Bolsheviks. Uh, Beatrice Webb wrote letters to uh, Lenin's wife, Krupskaya, very glowingly saying, we love your Bolshevik revolution. We support it. We hope it's successful because we want to see scientific governance. And if you remember when we had uh, our friend Rachel Wilson on, in her book, she covered the figure of Alexandra Kolontai who at that time was writing a lot of uh, books and articles about how the, the way to bring in the international order would be to destroy the family. 
And along with destroying the family, you got to also destroy the nation state because the nation state is kind of an extension of the family. And all of those are accurately seen by the, the socialist Marxists as roadblocks to the global order. But what not many people have understood is the power of monopoly capital to build the order and the infrastructure that the socialists themselves said they would take over. So the only way, and they actually say this, right? H.G. Wells said it. Uh, if you read the Ratio book, he covers it. Very few people have stumbled onto this, that some of the smarter inner party Marxists figured out that Marxism itself doesn't have the ability to build a gigantic infrastructure. The energy and power of capitalism does. It can build, you know, this global order that's, you know, rivals Atlantis, right, with its advances and its, you know, you know, technology and you know, amazing inventions like Bitcoin, all this kind of stuff, right? None of that comes out of socialism, Marxism. But what socialism Marxism does as a technology is that it's very useful in terms of infecting, subverting, and turning a nation over to an internationalist power structure. It consolidates wealth and power and transfers that wealth and power offshore. That's all it does, and it's very effective at that. And very wealthy, smart people and cunning people know that. Dumb people on the street think that they're actually going to get a universal basic income and they're going to get to live in, in their coom pods. And that's not what you get. You don't get any of that. This is a technocratic order that ultimately has the design of mass depopulation. And so a lot of this we've already covered, so I don't want to rehearse all the old stuff, but I'm happy to say that a book that has long been out of print that independently vindicates everything that we've covered in this great book is Dr. John Coleman's other book. We covered the Committee of 300, but guess what? He has another book that he wrote, the former uh, British intelligence analyst, Dr. John Coleman wrote, One World Order, the Socialist Dictatorship. And so, although it's probably out of print now because I've been mentioning on my live streams every time I mention a book, it sells out. You might be able to find a copy on Amazon, I don't know, but the thesis of his book is, is great because independent from Ratu and all these other texts, he's coming to the same conclusion that Professor Sutton came to, the same conclusions that other researchers have come to. And that is that the enemy in the Cold War wasn't actually Moscow. And people thought that, oh, well, if we focus everything on you know fixing Stalin and fixing Soviet problems and all this, then we'll finally be able to you know, breathe free and the world can be free and we can get rid of the evil empire and all that. But as many people who really dig into this research discover, the enemy was actually in Washington. And I don't mean it's just the federal government. No, 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 the corporate 100, corporate fortune, one, fortune 100, fortune 500, and the banking elites. That's the real power structure. And they are allied together in that Anglo-American Atlantis establishment power structure, which includes Israel as well, in that they would like to set up an eventual technocratic world socialist dictatorship. And they intend to do this via certain strategies and means. Now, we mentioned the 10 planks of the Communist Party. Some of those they were successful in, some of them weren't so successful. But they also have another list that they came up with after the Fabian Socialists saw the inadequacies of first Marx's plan, the 10 planks, and then the actual Bolshevik Revolution, where it succeeded, where it failed from their vantage point. So they went back to the drawing board. And when they went back to the drawing board, they came up with what we call Fabian Socialism, which is this slow approach model, not the overnight worker revolution, but a slow model of gradually bringing in each of these planks, but they're kind of reorganized. And so the Fabians came up with a plan uh, and they wrote it up. And this was their plan back in the days of Woodrow Wilson, under which we had World War I via the machinations of British intelligence and Colonel Edwin Mandel House, and under which we got the Federal Reserve. So big key plans there, sending nations to war to bankrupt them, to get them involved in an international order, 
out of which came the League of Nations. And the League of Nations was drawn up by Fabian Socialists to create a Fabian Socialist order. Now, the League of Nations failed in its, its, its ultimate goal. They didn't get what they really wanted from the League of Nations. However, at the time, according to Dr. Coleman, they drew up plans of a revamped, revitalized version of Marx's planks. They said, all right, let's, let's not go with Marx's 10 planks. Let's, let's revamp this and let's come up with seven points that the Fabian socialists had to take down the United States of America. And why would they want to take it down? Why wouldn't they want? Well, by taking it down, they mean retooling it and repurposing it for international socialist order objectives. So it doesn't mean completely destroying the country. It means turning it into something other than it has been. And they've been very successful in that. And if we understand this Fabian socialist model and plan, we actually can give context and meaning to a lot of the conflicts, a lot of the events that have been happening in the last the last century and, and where we are today in America, 2023. I mean, this thesis makes sense. It makes sense of a lot of these things. It makes sense of why it doesn't matter which people you elect, this plan marches forward. And I'm not trying to break everybody's wills or make you get, be black pill, but we have to see that this is who's really running things, right? And remember when Ron Paul talked about the Federal Reserve? Has everybody just forgotten the Federal Reserve? I mean, Trump at least talked about it some. He wanted to take actions, at least according to his some of his campaign talk against the Federal Reserve. But nobody even thinks or talks about the Federal Reserve. Right? We just forgotten about this. I mean, that's still running the country. That's still why, right? We lose our purchasing power and we lose all of our, uh, you know, the, the the dollar is fiat. It's it's going to nothing, right? eventually. But we just forget about that because we're entertained by the next thing on the news, this person, this mass event or whatever, or, oh, there's going to be a new conflict here or there. And we, we, the news just dominates everybody's focus and attention in a very effective way to forget the real issues, right? Fortune 100, Fortune 500, big banks, Federal Reserve, that's what controls the country. So what were the Fabian Socialist seven point plans, the retooled plan that they came up with under the Wilson administration? And remember, not too long after this, you get FDR, who pushes the New Deal, all drawn up by Fabian Socialists. Well, the number one plank for the new revamped Fabian plan was, we must overcome, not completely destroy the way the Bolsheviks did, but to permeate and penetrate the Christian religion. What did Klaus say? It would penetrate the cabinets. Klaus is saying the Fabian socialist strategy, permeate and penetrate. That means take over the institutions, not destroy them like Lenin tried to do, just, oh, just completely destroy the church, tear them all down. That didn't work. Uh, but what they found was much more effective was to create international institutions like the World Council of Churches, National Council of Churches, uh, originally, before that, they had what they called the uh, the Faith Forum or something like that. That was sort of the proto uh, one world religion movement that was going on in the in the 1920s and 30s. That eventually would morph into the Rockefeller funded World Council of Churches, National Council of Churches. And so this strategy was self conscious on the part of these very wealthy people and their friends in the Fabian Society. And amazingly, Beatrice Webb, George Bernard Shaw. Sidney Webb, these Fabian socialist ideologues, they got a bunch of money from the British elite. They were also successful in convincing a bunch, a bunch of very wealthy American uh, industrialists and entrepreneurs to put a bunch of money into their stuff too. They, they, were, uh, they impressed Henry Ford, they impressed David Rockefeller, and a host of other, uh, Laura Spellman Rockefeller Fund, they, she gave tens of millions of dollars to feminist Fabian socialists. And yes, all the Fabian socialists were feminists. So there's an alliance there. They're all they're all part of the same plan. In fact, the entire feminist movement in America all comes from Fabian socialists. Literally, all of it. Uh, and uh, Dr. Coleman has a whole chapter on all those women. Uh, Colin Ty, one of these. Uh, you can also read Rachel's book. She covers the same topic. Now, so permeating and destroying Christianity from within, not completely getting rid of it, but turning it into something that's a tool of the one world state. And you have to do that because 
to level all the religions and make them essentially all kind of on the same spectrum. They're all, oh, we all, we all believe in the same God. There's just one sort of generic God and all the religions are pointing to that, right? Which is kind of a Freemasonic idea. This is the obstacle that they wanted to overcome through permeation and penetration through institutional capture. And now you see, of course, the Vatican pushing that very thing with the Abrahamic faith house, all the world religions together, or at least the, the Abrahamic religions. Of course, Paul says that you're not in the Abrahamic religion without Christ. There is no such thing as being in the Abrahamic faith without faith in Christ. Jesus says in John 5, Abraham saw my day, right? He worshiped me. Moses believed in me. There's no Abrahamic tradition if you're a Christian without Jesus, without the Trinity. So that doesn't exist, this idea that, oh, well, we all have the same monotheistic Abrahamic faith. Not unless you want to reject the New Testament. Number two, national pride of nation states. This was the second key plank in the Fabian Socialist seven point plank that had to be destroyed. And that's because, as we said, pride in your nation state is connected to your heritage, to your tradition, to your family, and in America, typically to Christianity or some form of Christianity for the most part. And so, number one, I said, Religion and Christianity had to be destroyed, especially permeated from within. Destroyed does not mean totally getting rid of it. It means turning it into a tool uh, for soft power for global elites to get people into this uh, nascent one world religion. The national pride has to go away. And we're at that point, right? So we've seen point one. Yes, they're very, they very much permeated all the uh, institutions that go by the name of Christianity, Protestant, Roman Catholic. Even in the Orthodox world, they've, uh, they've achieved permeation to push these uh, kinds of agendas. And we've also seen the decline in belief and pride in your own nation state. In a lot of places in the US, now you can't put up the American flag, they call it racist. That's exactly what the Fabian Socialists wanted. And they were actually pretty ahead of their time in saying, we gotta weaponize all this term of calling everything racist. That, that was a Fabian Socialist idea they came up with in the 1920s. So they were even way ahead of critical race theory stuff. They were pushing the woke stuff at the same time, or, or, or decades before anybody in the, the Marxist sphere was pushing it. And again, you can see why in order to have an international order, you've got to get rid of nation states. Nations, people groups don't exist. And one way you partly get rid of that is by mixing and flooding all the cultures with foreign cultures. This is called demographic warfare. Has nothing to do with quote being racist per se. It's an actual strategy of warfare. Kelly Greenall from uh, I think Stanford, what one of the big Army War Colleges. But there's books written on this, so there's actual military books on this. But you can't talk about it because it's supposed to be racist. But it's, a, it's I mean just look up Kelly Greenall's book. So to get rid of the nation state prepares for the international order. Patriotism, patriotism, another thing you can't have pride or the desire to self-defend. And guess what many of the Fabian socialists were uh, first pushing? They were some of the pioneer groups to push in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, and 20s. Pacifism, pacifism. You don't hear pacifism talked about much, but pacifism is actually a socialist technique of disarmament. Because remember, pacifism is not just about, oh, I'm anti-war. I mean, I'm typically anti-war because most of the wars are not fought for the reasons that we're told. They're fought for very powerful, wealthy people, corporate interests, and so forth. So that's why I, I don't support. I don't. I'm not dying for Coke and Pepsi in another country so that uh, Iraq and Ukraine can have subway and abortions. I'm not. Why would I want to die for that? Um, but patriotism has to go away because patriotism stands in the way of you being obeisant to the international order. And a lot of what you what you see here is actually outlined in Brave New World. Remember, we just covered Brave New World again recently. And so this one world socialist dictatorship, not Marxist, but socialist, there is a difference. The difference being reorganized reform Marxism is Fabian socialism. And that's the effective model. That That's the model that has turned the EU socialist. They were all Fabians. All of these international institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, they're all Fabian socialist institutions. John Maynard Keynes, Fabian socialist. The Eastern Seaboard Establishment co uh, uh, Colleges, they're all peopled by and have been run for decades by 
people who adhere to Fabian socialism or forms of socialism. And there might be the occasional, you know, Ayn Randian type professor here or there, but that's a super minority. That that's the majority of where people are going in the last 50, 60 years in their thought process is towards socialism. All of the millennials and Zoomers that think they're going to get a UBI and think they're going to get that, all that socialism is nonsense. It's a trap. It's a tool to get you into this slave system. And Dr. John Coleman is 100% correct that all of these socialist countries become slave states. It doesn't deliver the promises. And it doesn't matter how many times it fails, people still believe in it because they just say, well, socialism does work, but the capitalist sabotaged it. We're always sabotaged by the evil capitalists. And it's like, how could you be sabotaged by the people that are funding and helping you come to power? Monopoly capitalism is what allows socialism to even occur. It funds it, it aids it. And the deeper inner party elite know this. They even say that in their books. H.G. Wells says to the Marxists, stop being dumb Marxists thinking that the capitalists are your enemy. He says this, he says, who do you think will build the international structure that we will take over? The capitalists. Number four plank of the reorganized Fabian strategy is we must get rid of or change the notion of the United States Constitution and its rule by law. So even though not everything in the in the Constitution is necessarily ideal from my vantage point, it could be a lot more explicit in some of its uh, values and so forth. It's kind of an enlightenment deist ish John Locke type thing. So but it also has a lot of good points in it as well. And one of those things, though, the good points is that there's limitations to power and limitations to centralization that's baked into the Constitution and our form of government, right? So everybody has these rights, but that's all being eroded by design. Eroded by design a long time ago. Again, this is the 1910s, I think, uh, when the Fabians drew up this, their plan, their seven plank plan, 1910s, 20s to completely change the landscape of America. And here we are 100 years later after this plan was drawn up and most of this seven point plank they've gotten in. So the constitution has to change because the constitution limits the power of the centralization model that these people all want. And so again, AOC, she doesn't know anything about this stuff, but she's default a socialist of this order precisely because she's a perfect product of this brainwashing and corporate control that created her, you see. So the corporate socialism I'm talking about churns out the AOCs as an example, who are turning our country into the very thing that the Fabians said they wanted 100 years ago. Number five, get rid of uh, the, or excuse me, implement the graduated income tax, the IRS system. And of course that occurred. Number six, or excuse me, number seven, the final plank, or excuse me, uh, I guess he's got this misnumbered. So it's six planks. The sixth plank is free trade. And this is uh, relevant because when Dr. Coleman was writing this book was back at the time when Ross Perot was talking about NAFTA and free trade and GATT and all that, and that it would be a giant sucking sound destroying the uh, industry in the country. And of course, that's true. Free trade is a social, Fabian socialist plan. Now people blow, their, their heads explode when you say this because they say, wait a minute, that's a free, that's a free market. What do you mean? Free trade, that ain't, that's the do, do, do. Now, did you know that if you go to Marxist.org, you can find the articles where Marx and Engels themselves argued for free trade. Why would they argue for free trade? That's a, that's a capitalist idea. Because free trade allows for the devaluation of the existing population's labor and their quality of goods, because it allows for the prices to collapse. And Marx knew this, and he actually says in one of his talks that hopefully this would cause the proletariat to get enraged and overthrow the country. So again, that's one example of Marx and Engels saying that let's institute a horrible policy that is damaging to the American worker or the worker of the, the nation state to enrage them to try to cause a revolution. 
So it's it's economic warfare and chaos to try to destroy the country to bring it down. And Beatrice and Sidney Webb, the, the Fabian Socialists actually know that they, they actually said these policies don't actually work to help the economy. They knew that it damages the middle class, it helps the 0.01%, but in destroying the economy, they actually believed, gradually bringing it down, destroying it over time, sapping it of its the dollar of its purchasing power, all of that, they actually believed that this would lead to everyone crying out for an international order. Save us, save us. The very thing Klaus talks about. The collapses, the wars, all of this, and I think that this could tie it into the potentiality of World War III that we, we may be going into. I mean, war is the health of the state. War allows uh, regions to be rebuilt, all of this. A lot of the uh, military industrial complex, of course, makes a bunch of money off of that. But it's also a way to say all of that, all this conflict resulted from religion and from nation states and the Bible. And it's time to throw all that away and enter into the pure Luciferian order of a one world socialist dictatorship where there's no religions except the pure worship of Lucifer. There's no nation states. There's just the technocracy. There's just the computers and the centralized grid giving you your nutrients in your coom pot, and then we get rid of